San Francisco in the Roaring Twenties is a city that hasn't quite shaken her old self. Scratch the surface of civilization and out pumps the hot, chaotic blood of her Barbary Coast days. Sometimes somebody needs help bringing order back to this chaos, and that's where I come in. I work for the Federated Detective Agency. Sixty Three Audio presents Adventures of the Federated Tech, created by Pete Lutz and Mark Slade, and dramatized from stories by Dashiell Hammett. This time, the late night killing of a local politician leads to some uncomfortable accusations that may or may not stand up in the harsh light of day. Tonight's story: Women, Politics, and Murder. Adapted for audio by Pete Lutz. I want you to find my husband's murderer. The police have done nothing. Four days, and they have done nothing. They say it was a robber, but they haven't found him. They haven't found anything. But, uh, but, Mrs. Gilmore, you you must keep calm. I know, I know. But they've done nothing. I don't believe they've made the slightest effort. I don't believe they want to find her, him. Him? You think it was a man? (laughs) I don't know. It might have been. I'll tell you. You can judge for yourself. Bernard wasn't faithful to me. There was a woman who calls herself Kara Kenbrook. She wasn't the first, but I learned about her last month. We quarreled, Bernard and I. He promised to give her up, but maybe he didn't. But if he did, I wouldn't put it past her. A woman like that would do anything, anything. And down in my heart, I really believe she did it. And you think the police don't want to arrest her? I didn't mean exactly that. I'm all unstrung and likely to say anything. Bernard was mixed up in politics, you know, and and if the police thought that politics had anything to do with his death, they might... I don't know just what I mean. I'm a nervous, broken woman and full of crazy notions. Straighten this tangle out for me. Find the person who killed Bernard. I'll do what I can. Do you know this Kenbrook woman? I've seen her on the street, and that's enough to know what sort of person she is. Did you tell the police about her? No. The detectives who came to see me acted as if they thought I might have killed Bernard. I was afraid to tell them that I had cause for jealousy. Maybe I shouldn't have kept quiet about that woman, but I didn't think she'd done it until afterward when the police failed to find the murderer. The police don't appreciate it much when information is withheld. But I couldn't make myself go to them and tell them that I had done that. I knew what they'd think, so I... (sighs) You can twist it around so it'll look as if I hadn't known about the woman, can't you? Possibly. Now, as I understand it, your husband was shot on Pine Street between Leavenworth and Jones at about 3 o'clock Tuesday morning. Is that right? Yes. Where was he going? Coming home, I suppose. But I don't know where he'd been. Nobody knows. He told me Monday evening that he had a business engagement. He was a building contractor, you know, a... He went out about half past 11, saying he would probably be gone four or five hours. Wasn't that an unusual hour to be keeping a business engagement? Not for Bernard. He often had men come to the house at midnight. Can you make any guess at all where he was going that night? No. I knew nothing about his business affairs. And even the men in his office don't seem to know where he went that night. How about enemies? I don't know anybody who hated him enough to kill him. Where does this Kenbrook woman live, do you know? Yes. In the Garford Apartments on Bush Street. Nothing you've forgotten to tell me, is there? No, I've told you everything I know. Every single thing. What Mrs. Gilmore had said about her husband's employees not knowing where he'd been the night of his murder wasn't unlikely. Most of the B.F. Gilmore Construction Company's work had been on city and state contracts And it isn't altogether unheard of for secret conferences to go with that kind of work. Your standard politician contractor doesn't always move in the open. Now, away from the Gilmore House and walking over to California Street, I shook down my memory for what I'd heard here and there about the murdered man. I could remember a few things. The opposition papers had been in the habit of exposing him every election year, but none of them got me anywhere. I'd known him by sight, a boisterous, red-faced man who had hammered his way up from laborer to the ownership of a multi-million dollar business and a pretty place in local politics. A roughneck with a manicure, somebody had called him, 
a man with a lot of enemies and a lot more friends. A big, good-natured, hard-hitting rowdy. Odds and ends of a dozen graft scandals in which he'd Taylor, been mixed Taylor. up, Taylor. without anybody ever really getting anything on him, flitted through my head as I rode downtown on the California Stopped Street cable street. car. Stopped in. Then there'd been some talk of a bootlegging syndicate of which Gilmore was supposed to be the leader. Kearney Street. Kearney. I left the car at Kearney and walked over to the Hall of Justice by Portsmouth Square. In the detective's assembly room, I found Ogar, the sergeant in charge of the homicide detail. He's a squat man of about 50 who goes in for wide-brimmed hats of the movie sheriff sort, but whose little blue eyes and bullet head are not handicapped by his choice of headgear. I want some dope on the Gilmore killing. So do I. But if you'll come along, I'll tell you what little I know while I'm eating. I ain't had lunch yet. Safe from eavesdroppers and the clatter of a Sutter Street lunchroom, the detective sergeant leaned over his clam chowder and told me what he knew about the murder, which wasn't much. Uh, one of the boys here. Uh... Patrolman Kelly was walking his beat early Tuesday morning, coming down the Jones Street Hill from California Street to Pine. It was about three o'clock, no fog or nothing, a clear night. Kelly's within maybe 20 feet of Pine Street when he hears a shot. He whisks around the corner, and there's a man dying on the north sidewalk of Pine Street, halfway between Jones and Leavenworth, and nobody else is in sight. <laughs> Kelly runs up to the man and finds it's Gilmore. The man dies before he can say a word. The doctors say he was knocked down and then shot. There was a bruise on his forehead, and the bullets slanted upwards in his chest. <laughs> you you want to crack her or anything? <laughs> you see what I mean? He, he was lying on his back when a bullet hit him with his feet pointing toward the gun it came from. It was a 38. Any money on him? Uh-huh. <laughs> 600 smacks, a couple of diamonds, and a watch. Nothing touched. What was he doing on Pine Street at that time of the morning? Damned if I know. <laughs> Chances are he, he was going home, but we can't find out where he'd been. Don't even know what direction he was walking in when he was knocked over. <laughs> oh, he, he was lying across the sidewalk with his feet to the curb. But that don't mean nothing. He could have turned around three or four times after he was hit. Oh, man. All apartment buildings in that block, aren't there? Uh-huh. There's an alley or two running off from the south side. But Kelly says he could see the mouths of both alleys when the shot was fired. Before he turned the corner, and nobody got away through them. Ogar tilted his bowl, scooped up the last drops of the chowder, and put them in his mouth as I asked, Reckon somebody who lives in the block did the shooting? <coughs> oh, that's good. Hmm. Maybe. But we got nothing to show that Gilmore knew anybody in that block. Many people gather around afterward? A few. There's always people on the street to come running if anything happens. But Kelly says there wasn't anybody that 
looked wrong. Just the ordinary night crowd. <clears throat> the boys gave the neighborhood a combing, but didn't turn up anything. Any cars around? Kelly says there wasn't. That, that he didn't see any. And couldn't have missed seeing it if, if there'd been one. What do you think? <sighs> oh, I don't think. I'm a police detective. Ogar, is the brass writing you on this case? <clears throat> oh, pardon. I have a line on a woman. Want to come along and talk to her with me? I want to, but I can't. I gotta be in court this afternoon in half an hour. Miss Cara Kenbrook? Yes. My card. I'm with the Federated Detective Agency. I'd like to ask you a few questions. May I come in? Do. If you'd like to sit, just push those things off the sofa. The place is a mess. Sorry. I'm interested in Bernard Gilmore's death. I watched her face as I asked this question. It wasn't a beautiful face, although it should have been. Everything was there. Perfect features, smooth white skin, big, almost enormous brown eyes. But the eyes were dead dull, and the face was as empty of expression as a china doorknob. And what I said didn't change it. Bernard Gilmore? Oh, yes. You and he were pretty close friends, weren't you? We had been, yes. What do you mean by had been? I gave him the air last week. When was the last time you saw him? Last week. Monday, I think. A week before he was killed. Was that the same day when you broke off with him? Yes. Where were you on the night he was killed? At the coffee cup, eating and dancing with friends until about one o'clock. Then I came home and went to bed. Why did you split with Gilmore? Couldn't stand his wife. Huh? She was a nuisance. She came here one night and raised a racket. So I told Bernie that if he couldn't keep her away from me, he'd have to find another playmate. Have you any idea who might have killed him? Not unless it was his wife. These excitable women are always doing silly things. What happened the night his wife came here? Nothing but that. She followed Bernie here, rang the bell, rushed past me when I opened the door, and began to cry and call Bernie names. Then she started on me, and I told him that if he didn't take her away, I'd hurt her. So he took her home. All right, Miss Kenbrook, that's all I have for now. I may be back later, though. All right. I walked out of the Kenbrook girl's flat, half convinced that she was full of dope. I left because I couldn't do anything with her at the moment. I didn't think she was telling the whole truth, but on the other hand, it wasn't reasonable to believe that anybody would lie so woodenly with so little effort to be plausible. So, from this unsatisfactory interview, I went to the scene of the killing, only a few blocks away, to get a look at the neighborhood. I found the block just as I'd remembered it, and just how Ogar had described it, lined on both sides by apartment buildings with two blind alleys, one of which was dignified with a name, Touchard Street, running from the south side. The murder was four days old. I didn't waste any time snooping around the vicinity, but after strolling the length of the block, boarded a Hyde Street car, transferred to California Street, and went up to see Mrs. Gilmore again. I was curious to why she hadn't told me about her call on Cara Kenbrook. The door was opened by a plump maid with bold green eyes and a loose, full-lipped mouth who was trying very hard to sound like she was from Atlanta. Well, Mrs. Gilmore's not at home. But I think she'll be back in a half hour or so. I'll wait. Oh, please make yourself comfortable here in the library. Thank you. <clears throat> hmm? Oh. oh, what's on your mind? Suppose. Suppose a person knew something that nobody else knew. What would that be worth to them? Well, uh, <clears throat> well, that would depend on how valuable it was. Suppose I knew. 
Who killed the box? Hmm. What would that be worth? The newspapers say that one of Gilmore's clubs has offered a thousand dollar reward. You'd get that. Oh, if you didn't get it first. Just so as you know, the Federated doesn't accept rewards and doesn't let its hired men accept them either. I'll give you my word, but you'll have to use your own judgment about trusting me. Hmm. Well, you're a good fella, I guess. I, I wouldn't tell the police because I knew they'd beat me out of the money, but you look like I can trust you. No, oh, why? Uh... I used to have a gentleman friend who was the very image of you, and he was the grandest. Better person speak your I... piece before somebody comes in. Uh, oh, <clears throat> I was coming home late Monday night, the night the boss was killed, and I was standing in the shadows saying good night to my friend when the boss came out of the house and walked down the street. And he had hardly got to the corner when she, Mrs. Gilmore, came out and went down the street after him, not trying to catch up with him. You understand, but following him. Now, what do you think of that? What do you think of it? I think that she finally woke up to the fact that all of her Bernie's dates didn't have anything to do with the building business. Do you know that they didn't? <laughs> do I know it? Oh, I knew that man. He liked him. He liked him all. <laughs> oh, I found that out soon after I first came here. Do you know when Mrs. Gilmore came back that night? What time? Yes. At half past three. Sure. Oh, absolutely. After I got undressed, I, I got a blanket and sat at the head of the front stairs. My room's in the rear of the top floor. I wanted to see if they came home together and if there was a fight. Well, after she came in alone, I went back to my room and it was just 25 minutes to four then. I looked at my alarm clock. Did you see her when she came in? Just the top of her head and shoulders when she turned toward her room at the landing. What's your name? Lina Best. It's short for Carolina. Well, isn't that just precious? All right, Lina, if this is the goods, I'll see that you collect on it. Keep your eyes open, and if anything else turns up, you can contact me at the Federated office. Now, you'd better beat it so nobody will know we've had our heads together. Alone in the library, I cocked an eye at the ceiling and considered the information Lina Best had given me. But I soon gave that up. No use trying to guess at things that will work out for themselves in a while. I found a book and spent the next half hour reading about a sweet young she-chump and a big strong he-chump and all their troubles. Hello. The maid told me you were waiting in here. Yes. Do you mind if I shut the door? What is it? Mrs. Gilmore, why didn't you tell me that you followed your husband the night he was killed? That's a lie. That's a lie. Don't you think you're making a mistake? Don't you think you'd better tell me the whole thing? <gasps> here, here, Mrs. Gilmore. Oh, pl please sit down. Here, give me your hand. There, there. Now, please, please. Shh, shh, shh. I did follow him. But I didn't kill him. Please believe that I didn't. <laughs> Please get up. Here, let me help you. Sit down. There. I didn't say you did. Just tell me what did happen. I didn't believe him when he said he had a business engagement. I didn't trust him. He'd lied to me before. I followed him to see if he went to the women's rooms. Did he? No. No, he went into an apartment house on Pine Street. In the block where he was killed. I don't know exactly which house it was. I, I was too far behind him to make sure. But I saw him go up the steps and into a building near the middle of the block. And then what did you do? I found a dark doorway across the street and waited a long time. It was chilly and I was frightened, but I made myself stay. I wanted to see if he came out alone or if that woman came out. I had a right to do it. He'd deceived me before. 
Then, it must have been about half past two, I couldn't stand it any longer. I decided to telephone the woman's apartment and find out if she was home. I rang her from an all-night lunchroom on Ellis Street. Was she home? No. I tried for 15 minutes. Nobody answered the phone, so I knew she was in that Pine Street building. And what did you do then? I went back there to wait until he came out. When I was between Bush Street and Pine, I heard a shot. (gasps) I know it was the shot that killed Bernard. When I reached the corner of Pine and Jones, I could see a policeman bending over a man on the sidewalk, and I saw people gathering around. I didn't know then that it was Bernard. In the dark and at that distance, I couldn't even see whether it was a man or a woman. Did you stick around after that? No. I was afraid to stay in that neighborhood for fear the police would ask me what I was doing, loitering in the street at three in the morning, and have it come out that I'd been following my husband. So I kept on walking up the street and then straight home. And then what? At nine o'clock that morning, two detectives came and told me Bernard had been killed. I hadn't slept a wink worrying about him, but not thinking it had been his body I'd seen in the street. Do you remember what they asked you? They questioned me so sharply that I was afraid to tell them the whole truth. If they'd known I'd had reason for being jealous and had followed him, they would have accused me of shooting him. And what could I have done? Everybody would have thought me guilty. So you didn't say anything about Miss Kenbrook or your activity of the night before? No. I thought they'd find the murderer and then everything would be all right. I didn't think she had done it then or I would have told you the whole thing the first time you were here. But four days went by without the police finding the murderer. And I began to think they suspected me. It was terrible. So I employed you. But I was afraid you would think I had killed him and would turn me over to the police if I told you everything. And now you do believe it. And you'll have me arrested and and they'll hang me. I know it. I know it. You're not arrested yet. (laughs) I didn't know what to make of her story. The trouble with these nervous type women is that you can't possibly tell when they're lying or when they're telling the truth unless you have outside evidence. Half the time, they themselves don't know. When you heard the shot, you were walking north on Jones between Bush and Pine. You could see the corner of Pine and Jones. Yes. Clearly. See anybody? No. Not until I reached the corner and looked down Pine Street. Then I saw a policeman bending over Bernard and two men walking toward them. Where were the two men? On Pine, east of Jones. They didn't have hats on, as if they'd come out of a house when they heard the shot. Any automobiles in sight, either before or after you heard the shot? I didn't see or hear any. I have some more questions, Mrs. Gilmore, but I'm in a hurry now. Please don't go out until you hear from me again. I won't. I left the library and Lina Best was holding the street door open for me. Well? You stick around too. Huh? I returned after this to the Garford Apartments, walking because I had a lot of things to arrange in my mind before I faced Cara Kenbrook again. And even though I walked slowly, they weren't all exactly filed in alphabetical order when I got there. She was now wearing a kind of filmy green gown. So she had changed her clothes, but not, I noticed, her empty doll's face. Some more questions. Mm. She admitted me and led me back into the room we'd talked in before. Miss Kenbrook, why did you tell me you were home in bed when Gilmore was killed? Because it's so. And you wouldn't answer the doorbell? I had twisted the facts to make my point. Mrs. Gilmore had phoned, but I couldn't afford to give this girl a chance to shunt the blame for her failure to answer on the dialing of a wrong number. No, because I didn't hear it. One cool article, this baby. I couldn't figure her. I didn't know then, and I don't know now, whether she was the owner of the world's best poker face or was just naturally stupid. 
But whichever she was, she was thoroughly and completely it. And you wouldn't answer the phone either? It didn't ring or not enough to waken me. <laughs> Miss Kenbrook, your phone rang at 2.30 and 2.40 that morning, and your doorbell rang almost continuously from about 2.50 until after 3 o'clock. Perhaps. But I wonder who'd be trying to get me at that hour. You didn't hear either? No. But you were here? Yes. Who was it? Get your hat, and I'll show them to you down at police headquarters. <sighs> I suppose I'd better get a cloak, too. Yes, and bring your toothbrush. You mean you're arresting me? Not exactly, but if you stick to your story about being home in bed at 3 o'clock last Tuesday morning, I can promise you, you will be arrested. If I were you, I'd think of another story while we're riding down to the Hall of Justice. Do you really think that I wasn't here when Bernie was killed? I'm a busy man, Miss Kenbrook. If you want to stick to your funny story, it's all right with me. But please don't expect me to stand here and argue with it. Get your hat and cloak. I suppose you do know something. Well, it's tough on Stan, but women and children first. I was in the coffee cup until one, and I did come home afterward. I'd been drinking vino all evening, and it always makes me blue. So after I came home, I got to worrying over things. Since Bernie and I split, finances haven't been so good. I took stock that early morning and found only four dollars in my purse. The rent was due and the world looked pretty damn blue. <sighs> Half lit on guinea wine as I was, I decided to run over and see Stan, tell him all my troubles and make a touch. Stan is a good egg and he's always willing to go to the limit for me. Sober, I wouldn't have gone to see him at three in the morning but it seemed a perfectly sensible thing to do at the time. Miss Kenbrook told me how, as she was walking to this Stan person's flat on Pine Street, she heard a shot and saw the patrolman bending over the dead man and also saw a few men gathering around. As she got closer, she recognized Bernard Gilmore on the sidewalk. She was shocked at this, but she kept going and went up to Stan's rooms. He let her in and she told him that Gilmore had just been shot. Stan acted shocked and admitted that Gilmore had just left his rooms after a meeting that had started at midnight. He asked the girl what had brought her there, and she told him her tale of woe. This was the first time he'd known of the girl's relationship with Gilmore. She'd met him through Stan, but Stan was unaware of how chummy they'd become. Stan was worried for fear it would come out that Bernie had been to see him that night because it'd make a lot of trouble for him. Some sort of shady deal they had on, I guess. So he didn't leave the flat to see Bernie. That's about all there is to it. I got some money from Stan and stayed in his flat until the police had cleared out the neighborhood. Then I came home. That's straight, on the level. Why didn't you get this off your chest before? I was afraid. Suppose I told about Bernie having broken off with me and said I was a block or so away when he was killed and me half full of vino. The first thing everyone would have said was that I'd shot him. I'd lie about it still if I thought you'd believe me. So Bernie was the one who broke off and not you? Oh, yes. I lit a Fatima and breathed smoke in silence for a while, and the girl sat placidly watching me. Here I had two women, neither that you could call normal. Mrs. Gilmore was hysterical, abnormally nervous. This girl was dull, subnormal. One was the dead man's wife, the other his mistress, and each with reason for believing she'd been thrown down for the other. Liars both, and both finally confessing that they'd been near the scene of the crime, though neither admitted seeing the other. What was the answer? 
either could have killed Gilmore, and suddenly all the facts I'd gathered, true and false, clicked together in my head. I had the answer, the one simple satisfying answer. I grinned at the girl and set about filling in the gaps in my solution. Who is this Stan fellow? Stanley Tennant. He has something to do with the city. Stanley Tennant? I've heard of him. He... Hello, Stan. This gentleman is from the Federated Detective Agency. I've just emptied myself to him about Bernie. Tried to stall him at first, but it was no good. Oh? And what conclusion have you come to? I've already had my invitation to take a ride. Tenant, a tall, broad-shouldered man dressed in tweeds, bent forward. With an unbroken swing of his arms, he swept a chair up from the floor into my face. I went back against the wall, fending off the chair with both arms, threw it aside, and found myself looking into the muzzle of a thirty-eight caliber revolver. Now, get his gun, Kara. Then, come sit over here next to me. All right. Face me again. You know me? Yes, I know you. You're Stanley Tennant, assistant city engineer and your record is none too lovely. You're supposed to be the lad who supplied the regiment of well-trained witnesses who turned last year's investigation of graft charges against the engineer's office into a comedy. Yes, Mr. Tennant, I know you. I chattered away on the theory that conversation is always somehow to the advantage of the man who is looking into the gun. I had a lot more to tell him, but he cut me off. You're the answer to why Gilmore was so lucky in landing city contracts with bids only a few dollars beneath his competitors. You're the bright boy That'll who... That'll do out of you. Unless you want me to knock a corner off your head with this gun. Get up, Kara. Now. <clears throat> he did that, Kara. Uh-huh. And. <clears throat> he did that. Mm-hmm. And now. <clears throat> he did that. All right. Here's our story. Bernie Gilmore was never in my flat in his life, and neither were you, Kara. The night he was killed, you were home shortly after one. You were sick from the vino you drank and called a doctor. His name is Howard. I'll fix it up with him. He got here, say, 2.30 and stayed for an hour. Today, this gumshoe comes around asking questions. He knew you hadn't killed Bernie, but he made certain suggestions to you, huh? And when you turned him down, he threatened to frame you. You refused, so he grabbed you, tore your clothes, and punched you in the mouth when you resisted. I happened to come along then, having an engagement with you, and heard you scream. I rushed in, subdued him, and took his gun away. Then we held him until the police came. Got that? Yes, Stan. Good. Now listen. We're gonna call the cops, and when they get here, this fellow will spill all he knows, of course. And chances are, we'll all get hauled in. So stick to this story. I ought to have enough pull to get you and me out on bail tonight. And maybe I can fix it so our fat little friend here will be held incommunicado for a day or two. And that'll give me the chance to take your story and add to it a few others from some ladies I know. And that ought to smash his rep for good. How do you like that? <laughs> you big clown. I think it's funny. Gara? Phone the police. And for God's sake, keep your story straight. What? Hey! Hey! Oh, no, you don't! I'd been waiting for Tennant to eventually take his eyes off me. And when he urged the girl to keep her story straight, I saw my chance and took it. His gun roared under my arm, but by some miracle missed me. I came in with my right fist and connected it with his jaw. There wasn't a second shot. He must have dropped his gun, but I didn't stop to look for it. I went after him with my fists, driving in, not giving him a chance to set himself. He was a head taller, with longer arms, but he wasn't any heavier or stronger than me. I suppose he hit me now and then as I hammered him across the room, but I didn't feel it. Once I had him in a corner, I discovered that his belly was flabby, so I kept throwing my right fist into it, and it got softer every time I hit him. I liked that very much. He was chopping at my face, but by digging my nose into his chest and holding it there, I kept my beauty from being altogether ruined. The next time I hit him, Tennant's knees sagged. Once more, I said to myself, then I'll step back, let him have one on the button, and watch him fall. 
But I didn't get that far. Oh, what was that? The Kenbrook girl must have found the gun and smacked me on the head with it. Not very hard, but it took some of the steam out of my punches. Ow, another. These taps weren't hard, but you don't have to hit a skull very hard with a hunk of metal for it to hurt. I tried to twist away from the next bump and failed. Not only failed, but let Tennant slip away from me. I wheeled on the girl just in time to take another rap on the head. Ugh. And then one of Tennant's fists took me over the ear. Ugh. I went down in one of those falls that get pugs called quitters. My eyes were open, my mind was alive, but my legs and arms wouldn't lift me up from the floor. <laughs> this is fine. All the signs of a struggle we need to make our story look good. Tennant took my own gun out of a pocket and held it on me as he sat down in a Morris chair, gasping for the air I'd pounded out of him. The girl sat in another chair, and I, once I could manage it, sat up in the middle of the floor and looked at them. <laughs> if they don't believe you were in a fight, you can strip and show them your little tummy. And you can show them this. Uh-uh. Go easy. My story'll still work if I have to kill you. Maybe work better. <sighs> Phone the police, Kara. Now, young fella, Mr. Tennant has told his side of the story. It seems to paint a pretty dark picture of you now, doesn't it? But I'm willing to hear your side of things, me lad. What have you got to say for yourself, eh? Just this. I'm working with Detective Sergeant O'Gar on a job. I want to talk to him over the phone, and then I want you to take all three of us down to the Detective Bureau. Why, that's ridiculous. Don't listen to him, Sergeant. Well, now I don't know. It has a queer look, this thing. I can't tell who started what in this fight. Looks like both of you got in your licks in lumps, that's a certainty. So I shouldn't wonder but what the detective bureau was the place for the lot of you. Clancy, take this one to the phone. <sighs> Do you know what time it is? I was just getting ready to hit the hay. It's nearly ten o'clock. Listen, I'm cleaning up the Gilmore murder. Meet me at the hall. Will you get a hold of Kelly, the patrolman who found Gilmore, and bring him down there? I want him to look at some people. I will that. Well, I had arranged to see Kara Stan this evening, so I went up to her apartment, and when I came in, I saw her on the floor, night, this so-called detective standing over. Trouble. At the Hall of Justice, McTighe, a lieutenant, was on duty. I knew him and felt we were on pretty good terms, but Tennant was an influence in local politics, and I wasn't. I don't mean to say that McTighe would have knowingly helped Tennant frame me, but if it came down to choosing... I knew who would get the benefit of any doubt there might be. My head was thumping and roaring with knots all over it where the girl had beamed me. I sat down, kept quiet, and nursed my head while Tennant and Kara, with a lot of details that they hadn't wasted on the uniformed men, told their tales to the detectives. What the hell is all this? Ain't that Stanley Tennant? Ah, oh, there you are. It's a lovely mess. Listen, in that nickel-plated gun on the desk, there's an empty shell. Get it for me. Mm -hmm. All right. After a questioning look from the lieutenant, Ogar broke open the revolver and took out the shell. He handed it to me. I thanked him and put it in my pocket. Now listen to our friend here. Sounds like he's winding up. Naturally, a man who tried a thing like that on an unprotected woman would be yellow. So it wasn't very hard to handle him after I got his gun away from him. I hit him a couple times and he quit, begging me to stop, getting down on his knees. Then we called the police. Tennant had made a believer of McTighe, not to mention the white-haired sergeant and the other two patrolmen. Even Ogar, I thought, might have been convinced by a story like that if the engineer hadn't added the neat touches about my kneeling. 
Well, what have you got to say? <laughs> I've got nothing to say about this dream. I'm interested in the Gilmore murder, not this stuff. Ogar is a patrolman here. Kelly. Patrolman Kelly, you found Gilmore's body? I did. Look at this young woman. Ever seen her before? Mm, not that I remember. Did she come up the street while you were looking at Gilmore and go into the house he was lying in front of? She did not. Now I'm showing you this expended shell. Kelly, why did you kill Gilmore? Oh, hey, he's going for his gun. I jumped for Kelly, but somebody grabbed me by the neck. McTighe aimed a big fist at my face, but it missed. My legs had suddenly been kicked out from under me, and I went down hard with men all over me. When I was yanked to my feet again, Kelly was weighing his revolver in the palm of his hand. His clear eyes met mine, and he placed the gun on the desk. Then he unfastened his shield and put it with the gun. It was an accident. What? Huh? What's the talk with now? Watch this, Kelly. Let's have it, Kelly. I was walking my beat that night. And as I turned the corner of Jones into Pine, I saw a man jump back from the steps of a building into the vestibule. A burglar, I thought, and cat-footed it down there. I called for him to come out, but got no answer. I started up the steps, but the bottom one was worn smooth, and I slipped. <sighs> I fell forward, and my gun went off just as he started moving towards me. He was hit. And he toppled over frontwise, tumbling down the steps onto the sidewalk. Uh, when I looked at him, I saw it was Gilmore. He probably didn't want me to see him coming out of Mr. Tennant's building, thinking I'd put two and two together and maybe talk. Kelly went on to say that even though it had been an accidental shooting, Gilmore's standing in political circles would have meant Kelly's downfall on the force, so he told the story the way we'd heard it. He didn't accuse anybody or say anything that might put the blame on an innocent party. He'd planned to come out and confess if anybody ended up going to trial for the killing and had gone so far as to write out a confession, which was at his home, so that nobody else could ever be blamed. That's why I had to say I'd never seen the young lady here. I did see her go into the building that night. The same one Gilmore'd come out of. But I couldn't say so without making her look bad. <sighs> anyway, I'm glad it's all over. So, I hope you'll let me square myself for this evening's work. But you know how it is when somebody you care for is in a jam. I'd have killed you if I thought it would help Kara on the level. Why didn't you tell us that you didn't suspect her? But I did. I suspected both of you. It looked like Kelly had to be the guilty one, but you people carried on so much that I began to feel doubtful. For a while, it was funny, you thinking she'd done it and she thinking you had, but after a time, it stopped being funny. You carried it too far. How do you tumble to Kelly? Miss Kenbrook was walking north on Leavenworth when she heard the shot. Mrs. Gilmore was walking north on Jones and was about the same distance away from the shooting. Neither of them saw anybody until they reached Pine Street but Mrs. Gilmore should have seen Kelly rounding the corner of Pine if he'd been telling the truth because he said that he'd been on Jones when the shot was fired. To me, Kelly was a logical suspect because he was the nearest known person to the murdered man when the shot was fired. I follow you. And on top of all that, Kelly let the girl here walk past him at three o'clock in the morning and go into the very building Gilmore had come out of without stopping her or questioning her, or even mentioning her in his report. That tells me that he knew who'd done the killing. Right, so I took a chance with the empty shell trick, betting that Kelly'd thrown his away and would think that... <clears throat> How about this assault charge, then? Uh, uh... In view of the way things have turned out, and knowing that Miss Kenbrook doesn't want the disagreeable publicity, why, I suggest we drop the whole thing. You know nothing's been made official yet, right, Lieutenant? Let the big man play his hand out. Don't let him drop it. Of course, if Miss Kenbrook doesn't want to press the charge, mm, I suppose. 
if everybody understands that the whole thing was a plant, and if the policemen who heard the story are brought in here now and told by Tennant and Miss Kenbrook that it was all a lie, then I'm willing to let it go with that. Otherwise, I won't stand for a hush-up. That's all right with everybody else? Very well. Let's have the patrolman back in here. You're a damned fool. Put the screws to him. Nuh-uh. Listen, Ogar, there's no sense in making a lot of trouble for myself just to make trouble for somebody else. Just let it ride. I'm doing this job. And so the policemen were found and brought into the office again and told the truth. A little while later, Tenant Kara Kenbrook and I were walking together like three friends toward the stone steps that led down to Kearney Street. You've got to let me do something. It's only right. Here, let me give you something. Whoops. Careful, I've got you. These steps are pretty slick. Um, no, Mr. Tenant. Let me give you something. What? Bye-bye. No! Oh! 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 Dan? Ugh. Tenant landed in a rather limp pile at the bottom. <laughs> Leaving his empty-faced lady love to watch over him, I strolled up through Portsmouth Square toward a restaurant where the steaks come thick. been listening to women politics and murder episode seven of season two of adventures of the federated tech our cast consisted of the following players pete lutz as the tech jerry elif as mrs gilmore rhiannon mcafee as the maid jason d johnson as ogar angela young as cara kenbrook jeff moon as stanley Tennant, frank guglielmelli as the cable car motorman and lieutenant mctighe paul arbisi as officer kelly and john bell as the police sergeant and other cops the theme and some incidental music was composed and performed by Dr. Ross Bernhardt. Women, Politics, and Murder was written by Dashiell Hammett and was published in the September 1924 issue of Black Mask Magazine. Mixing and mastering were performed by Daniel French of Fishbonia Sound Design. This program was adapted by and produced under the supervision of Pete Lutz. This is Darren Rockold speaking. Please join us next time when the Federated Tech says... A trip south of the border to find a runaway husband leads to a triple murder north of the border and the deadliest love triangle you ever heard of. Be with us for our next episode, The Golden Horseshoe, part one of a special two-part adventure, coming soon from 63 Audio. Yeah, 63 audio.